Hi, everybody. My name is Rick Twaniak, and I'm the uh, Senior Director of the DevNet program. And we're here today to talk to you about the power of cloud collaboration APIs. Um, so uh, I'm hoping to make this interactive. So if I can get some questions from the audience, uh, I'll give out some uh, DevNet scarves. And these are collector's items. So there's not many of these left, OK? So you'll be some of the only people that get these. So let's try to make this interactive. Um, I'd like to start off by having my uh, panel introduce themselves. We've got some really good people here today. Uh, Snorri, we'll start with you. So uh, thank you, and thank you for uh, inviting me here. Uh, I'm Snorri Kespu. I'm the VPGM for uh, the video business uh, under collaboration. Cool. Casey? Excellent. My name's uh, Casey Bleeker. I'm one of the uh, business development managers covering all of our cloud collaboration API products. Great. My name is Brian Dreyer. I'm the director of product management for Vbrick. My name is Sarah Axelrod. I'm the COO of an Australian technology partner of Cisco's called Local Measure. So you came the longest way from I came Australia. A very long way. Wow, yeah. how long was your flight? It was supposed to be about 33 hours, but most legs were delayed, so it was actually even longer than oh, that. Wow, let's <laughs> hear it for. That's awesome. Uh, okay, uh, question to the audience um, How many people here are customers of collaboration products? Just so I get understand with the audience. Okay. So the, the lone person who raised her hand, you will get a scarf. <laughs> to the customer, right? How many people are developers? OK, cool. So you guys are using your APIs. How many people are from the channel? We have a few people from the channel. OK, so we've got a mix, a mix of people. Let me uh, start off, Snorri. I'm going to start with you. Um, and if you can tell us a little bit about the current state of cloud collaboration, um, what you sort of see is happening in the industry, especially as it relates to APIs. Okay, so uh, first of all, we have made a strategic decision about three and a half years ago about shifting a lot of our investment from on-premise to cloud. Um, we went back and we started Spark. Spark, as you know, is, is out there. And Spark is not only a messaging platform, but it's also a collaboration platform. It is a back-end on which you can register both the phones and uh, video endpoints and not at least the new Spark board uh, that we have uh, released. But as part of that shift, it was not only about making collaboration move to the cloud, but it was also about opening up the, the collaboration platform to developers. So amongst other things, we went out and we made a Tropo acquisition where we actually acquired a team into the collaboration space of people that actually made good APIs and were in that business already. So what you can do today is that you can actually develop your own applications and services on top of Spark, as can you develop uh, on top of the endpoints if, if you want to. And we're doing all sorts of useful stuff like being able to have different type of bots that can, can uh, warn you when you get certain type of messages into your rooms. Um, you can actually control the room from your codec using the APIs. And then we do lots of really fun stuff that's not necessarily that interesting, but we have a bot now that can count the number of people in the room and then can order chocolate for everyone that attend the meeting. So uh, it's, nice. it's, it's one of those things that we're, uh, we're trying to do here. Very, very cool. Casey, you work out in the field a lot, right? So you work with our customers. Absolutely. Are you seeing some cool stuff out there in terms of use cases? I, I think the most important thing is, is that, to Story's point, we're building a platform. So it's not just use case centric. In the past, we used to say, this is the use case that we're prescriptive to our customers, that this is the use case for our tools and how you're going to integrate it. And I think in the past, Cisco has always been top of the field in delivering workloads, the tools that people use for specific tasks. I think we could arguably say in, in many categories the best. But what our customers are the best at building is workflows. And now that we've put a lot of these things in the cloud, they can connect all the different workloads that we're delivering into the different workflows that really differentiate them as customers. So I get to talk with a lot of different groups about business processes, the automation that they're delivering to be more agile, to be more efficient, to have better scale. 
And so the same reason we have a developer platform to get better scale, better reach, the customers want to use our tools in that way too because they're getting more agility, they're getting more scale, and they're really getting to, to kind of be, uh, uh, there's a low barrier to entry. So I'll give you a use case that I had uh, in healthcare. Um, I was talking with a customer and they said, well, what would it take for our medical uh, uh, system to alert all of our nurses? Well, they actually were able to prototype that out in a day and that was the low barrier to entry. So we're now in a world where they could actually try it, fail quick, switch to a new use case. So the use cases are constantly evolving. And if it takes a six month project or a year project and it's difficult, they're not going to constantly evolve and, and try those different things. So I think that's the cool thing about the platform is as their use cases change weekly, monthly, daily, they're able to evolve those use cases on the platform as well. Cool. So, so Brian. Yeah. Uh, Casey just uh, started us off on this idea of sort of vertical markets. What are some of the vertical applications that you see out there? Maybe even the ones, so you develop yeah. the apps, right? So what kind of vertical apps or even horizontal apps uh, do, you, do you develop and work with? Yeah, absolutely. So at Vbrick, we're a Cisco partner. We provide the enterprise video cloud that powers a lot of the collaboration systems. So, it's nice that you can play video, but what do you use video for? And the APIs too ties hand in hand, which is why it's such a great partnership. Um, in the healthcare world, so this is a really good one, right? So we're working on a customer right now to really do a lot of the doctor-patient visits. That's a, that's a very important thing that actually is shifting in healthcare. And Cisco's got a lot of the, the calling features. That's great. So where we tend to come in, and this is where our APIs become so really important, is because we can back that up with a content management system. So it's nice that you can make it, well then what happens to the asset afterwards? You know, and you can say that about a PowerPoint or a Word doc, but video is a fundamentally different video um, enterprise asset. So whether that's approval workflows, getting it ready for search, you know, the cool thing is we've prototyped things like Spark bots so that you can search your video repository directly from Spark, right? That's an API that you need. Um, automatic ingestion, those kinds of things as well. So it's kind of interesting. Um, healthcare is obviously a big one. One of the ones that we get pulled into a lot is HR and onboarding. What we find is video really lowers the barrier to onboarding for new employees. So, well, how do you find the video, right? Well, you can, obviously, we, you know, we make a portal, it's great, but what we really are pushing people towards is more of a Spark-centric solution where you have these training rooms, right? And Spark is great for this because you've got this team concept where new employees can live in these rooms for like 90 days as they're onboarding. They can talk to each other and ask general questions, but we can share content in. Right? And you're using APIs to communicate the two because we've got all the analytics. We know who's watched it. We can check off all the certifications, make sure that's happened. But when you want to ask questions, when you want to go back and reference, this is where it's nice to have a, uh, a solution that works hand in hand. Okay, great. Sarah, what are you seeing out there in terms of uh, use cases and applications, either vertical or horizontal? I think probably one of the most exciting things, and this kind of goes back to, to Casey's point, is just that we now have the ability to combine total, what were previously totally distinct data sets. So in particular for us, uh, the ability to combine things like Wi-Fi, social media data, um, and location data together, and the power of all of those data sets when they're combined to be able to surface new insights and um, really contextual data for businesses and then actually using workflows, channeling it through to you know, co the collaboration frontline teams, which we've integrated with Spark to do, um, that enables us to leverage the power of all of those data, all of those distinct data sets to surface really powerful operational um, opportunities for frontline teams so that ultimately what that means is that they're able to use that to provide better customer experience, which is something that I think is, is the coolest, is to actually see how all of that comes together to provide a, a better experience for the, for the end customer. Okay. Is there, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your company and, and what you do and, and the types of applications yeah. specifically? Yeah, sure. So, so local measure, what we do is we essentially are, are pulling in social media data from a specific physical location using various location-based signals. And we're servicing that to businesses, particularly in the hospitality, tourism, and travel vertical, um, to be able to um, help the frontline staff and various you know, marketing departments to kind of leverage all of that data to provide better experiences for customers. So, 
And we're actually integrated into two parts of Cisco's solution. Um, we have integrated recently into Meraki as well as Spark. Okay. So um, to pull in the, the location analytics API from Meraki to add that additional level of context to match uh, the Wi-Fi location with some of the social contextual social media information about kind of how that person has interacted with the business, and then actually um, through a workflow channel that back through Spark, so that the, um, for example, the front frontline staff can actually use that to provide and personalize the customer experience because they have all that additional context that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Very cool, and, and I like the the fact that you're using two different APIs from yeah. two different BUs at Cisco, and how helpful was DevNet in find, helping you find those APIs and work with the APIs? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was amazing. I think that um, my engineering team was able to build a solution in really a matter of days in terms of getting a prototype up, and I think that that was only possible because it was a cloud-based solution. I think that if we were trying to do something with maybe one of the more traditional solutions, it would have been really overwhelming for us. I mean, we're a small team and, and resources are, are limited, and so this is a great way to be able to kind of get something off the ground really quickly. Brian, are, are you using multiple APIs? Uh... Yeah, we've got integrations into a handful of places. So on, um, on the more basic ones, so we've got direct integration into WebEx. We've had that for a while. So right. you can just grab your recordings, bring them in, and adjust them. We've done Tropo integration, so you can actually share video with SMS. Um, Spark, we've used as a notification platform, so you can actually subscribe to content in our solution and then get notified within your Spark rooms. Now, the new ones that we're working with, too, are a lot of SIT-based integrations. So where we're actually going a step further is using more SIT-based um, integrations to extend the video solutions into live streaming and recording. So our solution can do some recording. I mean, I know the Cisco has a lot of its own recording, but we can pick up some um, some other work there, but the live streaming is interesting now because what we can do is take something like WebEx and we're prototyping it with Spark 2 right now um, and you can use that to extend to tens of thousands of people. So we talked about video content management as one use case. Live streaming to an entire organization is our other big use case. So when your CEO wants to give a town hall to your entire organization but keep it completely internal, you know, we're the leader in that space. So we can scale 5, 10,000, 20,000. That's, that's normal for us. You know, that sounds like a lot of an internal, and it is a lot internal. It's not a lot for Facebook, but it's a lot for an internal system. And what we're able to do now is convert that WebEx into a town hall broadcast. Wow. Um, so we can do a lot of that too. So that, that helps. Very cool, yeah. very cool. So you guys are experts, um, and you probably have some really technical people working with these APIs, mm -hmm. and a wide breadth of APIs. Casey though, you know, you're out there with the customers, and we have a customer over here. Um, how we, I mean, do you have to be really technical to work with these APIs? So I, I think number one, short answer is no. Okay. Uh, now this is the, things I mean, have been standardized I mean, have you, have in the have cloud. You developed, have you developed an app? I Did have. Okay, I'm a sales so, guy, and I've, I, I, it, some of you guys have used the Sales Connect bot. I wrote that over a weekend, okay. uh, and that was like my first foray into programming and bots. So that was something that I used DevNet resources to learn how to how to interact with. But I think there's the overall thing is that what we're doing is we're increasing the relevancy of IT here. Whether I have no coding skills, I can go to the, to the Spark Depot. And local measure is a great example. I saw how many people raised their hands that they were developers. Probably even less people said that they know what local measure is. But I guarantee you the people in your organization who know what that tool is are in the marketing department. And they get to go to the depot, install that integration themselves, and connect those two cloud services, and they never picked up the phone and opened up an IT help desk ticket. They never initiated a six-month pro services engagement for a custom integration. So in a minute, they're adding value to the platform you've already deployed on-prem and in the cloud, and so you're adding relevancy to your organization. You're taking benefit of all the development scale that we've deployed without even being a developer. We've also worked with tools like If This Then That, Built.io, Zapier, Workato. They're like drag and drop integration platforms so that you can do programming type tools and really create custom integrations with your own business logic and rules without knowing a single line of code. So really powerful tools, um, but even if you want to start learning the programming tools, we've come out with some really cool uh, support, both through DevNet, all the learning modules, as well as the Spark uh, and Tropo 24-7 support. 
which is really, really different than the way Cisco did it in the past. If you called before and said, I got something custom, you might, they might start lowering the receiver, right? Now your web dev can actually join a 24-7 Spark room. They don't need to have a Cisco contract. Whether you're a third-party partner or a Cisco customer, we're really growing that audience. So you guys are going to see a huge amount of scale of all the different third-party integrations that are just going to add value to the investments you've made with Cisco Collab. So, so you brought up a couple of new concepts here. So one of them, you mentioned the Spark Depot. How many people out here know what the Spark Depot is? Raise of hands. Okay, so we have a few Cisco people. So who else can <laughs> raise your hands again? Who, who, who's heard of the Spark Depot? Okay, so Zeus. How, so I'm gonna, who wants to tell me what the Spark Depot is? <laughs> or Depot. What you think is, here you go. All right, let's get him a microphone here. Well, what's your experience been with the Spark Depot? I mean, it, I might be a biased because I am Cisco, but... Ah, uh, you're Cisco. Oh, okay. All but right. I'd be happy to tell you about it. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So, Cisco... Well, what uh, do you do for Cisco? Uh, I'm a bit of a spark evangelist. All right. <laughs> so, uh, one of the, the secret superpowers of Spark is how extensible it is with APIs. So, uh, you know, bots are the new app, apps, basically. So, it's our app store. So, instead of having five, 10, 20 different places to check, uh, integrate everything together with the uh, integrations we have in the depot, uh, use the bots to automate that stuff, and Spark becomes just sort of one-stop shop for collaboration. So all our awesome partners like Local Measure and various other ones are finding new, cool, interesting ways to leverage the Spark platform to help you get things done. And the Spark Depot is where all that good stuff lives. So the other thing, uh, Casey, you talked about is the support that they get uh, from the DevNet team and the collaboration team to make it a lot easier. 24 by 7 support, no cost. How many people out there have used the support? Has anybody tried to integrate with Spark or some of our cloud collaboration and has used the support? If okay. you're at all interested, I suggest you go to developer.ciscospark.com, click on the support tab and join the Spark support room because you'll actually get to see our 24-7 support helping people, and they're answering questions like, what programming language should I start to learn with? Where should I get started? Can somebody point me to a GitHub repository that's an example code sample of this? And literally, we're debugging people's code with them and saying, oh, you have a typo on line 43, okay? That's the level of support we're engaging with at Cisco now, is helping people learn, helping them get started, giving them recommendations and guidance, versus previously was just, you know, oh, our product's up and running, you're fine, right? You, you've got to sort it out yourself. So we're very, very engaged 24-7. Point your web developers there, people who know nothing about your collab investments or your collaboration portfolio. They'll understand and start to be able to consume those. I had a call with a customer who invited their web devs on, and their web developers emailed me a week later and said, we just built our third bot for our organization. It, so it, it really, can, really amazing. Uh, Casey, how much does it cost for this support? Zero. Zero. Zero dollars. Okay. So that's a, that's a big change. So for those of you that have tried to partner with Cisco, I mean, a lot of, you know, for some of the older UC technologies, $3,500, $5,000 for support. And what we're trying to do is reduce the friction. So that's interesting. Have you guys had a chance to use this support? Uh, yeah, I'll be a, a working reference for that. Because when we built our first Cisco, our Spark integration, I was like, one of our engineers had a question. I was like, well, I'm already in this room. Why don't you just join too? Because someone will probably answer it right away. And, Clear the blocker right away. So we've been in there. Excellent. I would say above and beyond just the technical support. I mean, really, from from my perspective, we've really we've re, we've just received so much kind of it. Um, you know, it feels really like a partnership. So I think a lot of the times it's you know it's one thing to have a have a technical issue and have somebody to help you troubleshoot. I mean, from our point of view, we've we have just had so much support and in the broader sense of the term from the Cisco team in terms of really partnering with us to not only help us build a successful integration, but to really be successful commercially, longer term, in, the, in kind of the broader sense, to, to bringing that to market and to bringing that uh, to not only our customers, but to, you know, to Cisco's customers as well. That's Excellent. a good point. I'll make one real Please. quick point on. I, I got a chance to chat, uh, talk at the Chatbot Summit in Israel, and I talked with a lot of the leading bot builders on other maybe consumer platforms. That was the number one thing they said they were impressed about what Cisco had built here, 
was a platform for them to reach real customers with real engagement, with real monetization strategies. And that's our goal is to have like this growth pattern of real enterprise ready applications and third party relationships that our customers can rely on rather than just hundreds of gift bots, right? <laughs> so th you're going to see a, a huge growth uh, in, in, that, in that relationship. So you're out there with the field working, in, uh, in, introducing these to the customers. Snorri. If I can add a comment to what they've said here, I think yeah. it's really about creating the bots, creating the apps, and being able to, to make that integration. What I see this as is a huge opportunity for our partner community as well. So if you take video as an example, the partner community are, has used to be AV integrators. They've come with their cables and their loudspeakers and their microphones and their paint and their walls and what have you. Now I think if we look forward, the, one of the capabilities the partners need to have is the ability to actually write customer or even business specific bots on top of Spark, on top of video, on top of Spark boards, all of those type of things. That's where there's a lot of opportunity and, and differentiation that could be made for our partners going forward as well. Okay. And again, how many channel partners do we have out here for systems integrators? One? Okay. Two? Do you guys have, have you guys had any experience working with Spark? Not to put you on the... No? Okay. Um, I'm going to throw it out to the group. Any questions? I'm going to take a break here. I know I'm asking all the questions here, but does anybody have, now you get a scarf if you ask a question. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. There you go. So obviously there is quite a lot of, uh, people is really happy with all these integrations with APIs and everything else, and there is quite a lot of hype everywhere. I think that's day one. We get a solution, we get a working thing with, when you integrate two APIs. What happens with day two? When you start like linking multiple services together and then you have to maintain that across the time. So there will be one provider who will upgrade their service, then you may break the workflow. Do you have any experiences around that? What is the, uh, what is the ideas around that, the, the service model? Yeah, so I think that's a, an ongoing issue when you have agile services, but I mean, uh, I think the, the number one thing is we're adhering to kind of the, the new paradigm of APIs, which is versioning, automatic deployment of new features in that agile workspace. And so if you have to deploy something on our Spark V1 API, that's not going to break. Now, we might release a V2 with new features or new, new formatting in the future, but that's not going to break. We've also looked at, and this is something that some, uh, some, some small services are starting to deploy on, no major enterprises have, but what we, what it's uh, called automatic swagger deployment. Basically, you can ingest a file that automatically describes our service to your application so that when our application changes, your application can automatically change with it. And there's a lot of things like that that, that we're exploring. Um, but today, it's, it's very versioned, very, very version controlled. And so you wouldn't have to be uh, concerned about our application changing. Other third parties, yeah, you might have to be a little more concerned about because that does, does happen in an agile cloud world. Um, but we are seeing a lot of web applications, um, specifically our third-party uh, application integration partners, subscribe to those feeds and those updates and are actually changing their API logic. And your underlying uh, application or library can consume those services so that your code doesn't have to change when their endpoints change. So there's a lot of new tools out there to make that kind of uh, uh, residual. And I think you bring up a really good point. I talk to ID part IT departments day in and day out. Bespoke is a dirty word. Custom built is a dirty word. Because we used to hire in contractors and have a six month project plan meeting and a year worth of professional services and then they're out the door and it's broken six weeks later, right? Well, now the world has changed and to keep up with the pace of your own organization, you have to do these kind of custom integrations and other resources in your organization are aware of some of those tools, the tool sets to be able to move quickly and not have those things be such a high cost investment and constantly uh, uh, open for change. Snorri? And, and if I can add on to it, it's a, it's a great question. One of the reasons we bought these guys uh, was actually that they came in with that professionalism that we frankly lacked. Uh, and by acquiring Tropo, and I've had uh, the Tropo guys actually go out and spend time with the Video Endpoints guys as well on how we can actually move our, our APIs to the next level.
so that we can actually have something that's consistent. As he said, 1.0 will always work, but you will add more in 2.0, but it will not break what was in, in the earlier one. And I think getting that team on board has really transformed the way we're thinking about it and how we're going to be able to do it going forward. So it's, it's a huge uh, opportunity, and I think as well, that acquisition clearly shows our commitment uh, to this space. And for me, it was just running a big business for Cisco, realizing there's no way I will ever be able to staff my business so that I can do every single need for every single vertical. I need help. My verticals need help. My partners need help. My customers need help. And by being able to tap into a broader community, by being able then to offer this uh, as a platform, then we're going to be able to do a lot more uh, than we were used to in the past. And you, it's not like I sit in a customer meeting and they ask, okay, when, I can get, when can I get that feature? And it's like 18 months out. Now it's like, you know what? Here's the I API, here you get information, go write it yourself and you can be done in three weeks. Very different approach and very excited about it. Thank you, excellent question. Any other questions right now? Anybody? Okay, I'll, I'll keep going with the group. What's a bot? <laughs> and, and, and what's a chat bot? And, and can you kind of describe it and give me some use cases and some examples? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll you take You better that. be able to describe it. it. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, so I would say a, a, a bot is, has its own identity, right? It, it's almost like a personality. And it's your own personal assistant. And, and like what it, series of bot, right? Series of bot, exactly, okay. yeah. Cool. And, and by the way, bots is just a fancy word for applications, right? But okay. now we have interfaces that we use day in and day out that are rich, that are extensible, like Spark, and it makes it easier to interact with those, right? Writing a custom integration into an XMPP client was not really easily scalable or possible. Now we're delivering tools that somebody can easily write something that's conversational, that somebody can interact with, and I think that's really why bots are starting to take off because uh, somebody who's been in your administrative department for 20 years doesn't know CLI commands, but they can say, can you help me get this expense report filed, right? So that's a use case, is things that take ta time, that are menial, things that take time to load a web page, to log in, to authenticate, to remember what the bookmark was, now where was that link again? Um, anything that is just a repetitive task that you might do just can add immense scale. I mentioned the Sales Connect bot. It's, it's probably the most simple and horrible UI design bot that we could possibly have. It just literally just takes what you ask and shoves you responses. But it gets about 1,000 uses a day internally at Cisco looking for documents. That's an example I share with a lot of customers because that saves each, each search, saves about three to five minutes. So you think about the, the, the efficiency gains you can make from a very, one simple use case within your business Sometimes that can be more, about, more powerful than the collaboration platform itself in terms of improving in individual efficiencies throughout the day. What kind of bots are, are you seeing out there or do you work with or use? I mean, the two that we're going, I mean, personally speaking, yeah. you know, we did one actually similar to your Sales Connect one. We did a search one too, right? For the same reason, right? It's, it's where you are, why leave it if you just want to go find some content. Um, the other big one too is where, like I said, we've been prototyping one to actually record a Spark call. Um, using our video stack. So doing nothing but typing the words, start recording into his message, you know, we can use the APIs all behind the hood um, to actually bring our system as a participant into the session, um, do the recording, it's available in our system, but linked from Spark. So the user hasn't ha actually gone anywhere. Um, all of a sudden you get a recording available right within your Spark uh, room. Sarah? We actually did a, a dev day, a local measure, all around Spark bots. Which was a really so cool. What's it? A dev day. A dev day. So we had all so of our okay. we had all of our engineers in Sydney take a, a day to focus exclusively on kind of coming up with different bots use, using the bots API, and it was it was really cool because by the end of the day there were so many different things that they had already created in terms of prototypes, uh, and it was also a really great way to get them really bought into it because they had so much fun going through that process. So we now have off the back of that, have three different bots. Um, so all kinds of different ways to essentially pull that social media data and make, make it contextually relevant within Spark. So for example, you could say, 
you know, local measure, show me Cisco Live Berlin, and it'll automatically pull in the five most recent social media posts from this venue, or local measure, show me influencers, and so it'll pull in, you know, the most recent social media posts by influencers who have posted here at this location. So it's kind of a nice way to take what would otherwise be kind of a totally different use case, which is kind of social media in, in the context of, of Spark, but also, and not just do it in kind of a data dump type of a way, but do it in a way that makes it contextually relevant and helpful for the, for the person who's actually using it. That's a, a, another great point Sarah just made is, bots bring context. There's all types of context in the enterprise. They might be in your medical imaging system, they might be in your marketing system, they might be in your, your video recording system. And when I ask a bot, show me recordings, show me marketing data, it can be relevant to the context of the conversation I'm having in Spark. So maybe I'm with my marketing team and it's going to show all those relevant data. Or maybe it's uh, meetings or recordings that I had with those teams. And we're now going to start to be able to get context out of the room systems. How many people were present? When were they present, right? There's lots of cool things that are coming to start taking those contexts and merge them with things like your ticketing and incident management systems and putting those into your Spark incidents and Spark spaces. So taking context from Spark or taking context from other pieces of your enterprise and putting it in Spark is amazingly relevant. So Casey, you just gave me my next question. I was going to go to Snorri. So we got advantage of Snorri here because you run the show, right? Sort of, I guess. Yeah, well, your people really run the show, right? Yeah. But, uh, Tell us what's coming new. What are some of the things, we have a number of developers out here, what should they be looking for uh, in terms of APIs? So, you know, if I'm going to tell you everything that's coming new, I had to kill you afterwards, so I can't do all of that. <laughs> okay. But what I can say is that uh, there's a number of new things coming, and I think the common denominator of everything we're doing is that our new engine is extremely powerful. If you look at the Spark board that we launched back in January, uh, how many people have seen the Spark board? Just a, a hand. So okay. quite a few of you. So the Spark board, just for the ones that don't know, is a video unit with a capacitive touch front end that is cloud connected only and goes straight into the Spark back end. And it allows you to collaborate, uh, it allows you to whiteboard, it allows you to do uh, video conferences and, and video back into Spark meetings. So that's Spark board. But the base engine in that is an engine out of a company called NVIDIA. And that engine can do a lot more than just voice and video. So I don't mean to brag, but I'll do it anyway. Cisco is really good at voice and video. I think we've kind of solved that. Yep. So what I told the guys is that for the next generation, that's table stakes. Nobody's going to be interested if our video is a little bit better, our voice is a little bit better. It actually happens to, do, to be. But what they're going to be interested in is the new features that we're going to be able to expose through APIs, the new features that you have there. And we have computational power in the endpoint that has never, ever been there before. It happens to be the same engine that's actually doing the self-driving of your Tesla or your Audi Q7. I happen to have one of those. And I'm very impressed by what that can do. We have the same capabilities now in the rooms with these new type of platforms. And, you, and, and the way you think about it, it's only your imagination that can limit what you can then start doing when you have a very powerful processing power in the room, very powerful 4K cameras in the room, and then you have a cloud service at the back of that and you have a development platform. What can a bot do for you? Awesome. I think that's the key question. Cool. So you just talked about all this opportunity you're opening up for innovation. I think you guys have an innovation fund or something like that. What is that? What we is absolutely that? do. All right, tell us a little bit uh, about so that. So I help manage the $150 million well, Cisco see, Spark Innovation Fund. Did anybody fund. know that there was an innovation fund available? Okay, so, so there got, is a hundred and fifty million dollar uh, Cisco, Cisco Spark Innovation Fund. Cool. All right, <laughs> hey, go for it. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, we, we've we've set aside uh, funding for both equity and non-equity investments, um, and what that means is we're looking for uh, investments to help spur and, and grow the Spark platform, but we're also looking to make non-equity investments, which which uh, with with uh, people who want to just fund some of their inv uh, investment costs, some of their engineering costs but it also funds a group of people who can go out and help our customers. 
So Nori mentioned that, you know, hey, we can now show a customer, yeah, that feature might be 18 months out, but here's an API. You can go develop that for yourself over the next two to three weeks. Well, we, now we can actually allocate some resources to that customer to go spend a couple days with their developer, bootstrap them, and really get them going and get a proof of concept running. And it's not a scoped engagement. It's not a paid engagement. It's just kind of a goodwill that we're trying to help scale our customers and our partners with. So there's lots of different opportunity, no matter where you sit within our spectrum of partner to customer. Um, there's a lot of things that the Spark Innovation Fund can help do to really lower the barrier to entry on the development platform. Sarah and Brian, did you guys know there was an innovation fund? We have actually taken advantage of the okay. innovation fund. Okay, all right, <laughs> cool. I am very aware. And, and, and did it help? <laughs> oh, absolutely, it was a all great right. incentive. All totally. right. So then we have to ask him for Sarah here. Uh, can we do some of that in Australian dollars as well? I, guess <laughs> yes. Australia, right? I don't know what the current Thank exchange is. Thank you for is. asking that on my behalf. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I think with your innovation and stuff, I mean, Make sure you tap into this guy's innovation I fund. Think I so. think so. Yeah. I'll follow yeah. up on with you on that, Casey. <laughs> cool. So, no, it sounds like, I mean, we've got all this uh, sort of innovation coming out of Cisco. We're making support zero dollar easy to access. We've got an innovation fund. We've got some go-to-market resources that are helping you. That's awesome. Okay. Let me, uh, questions for the group. Yes. As these new sort of capabilities and engines come out, um, what do you see the model? Are our business processes going to move into the collaboration spaces, or do your collaboration capabilities move more into the business process? Interesting. I think the latter, to be honest. Um, I, I think the collaboration will move into the business processes. And the, the reason I say that is that um, throughout the years, we've been very successful in certain vertical markets, but only certain. Pharmaceutical, uh, financial, I would say to a certain extent, military. But there are another 383 that we haven't addressed at all. And I think those are businesses that I don't have a perception of or an understanding of. And I think that the key must be for Collab to move in there instead of us trying to absorb all of that. I think if you go back and look at, at, at how Apple was able to disrupt the entire cell phone industry, it was not because they understood every single business on, on, on the planet. But you know, I don't buy train tickets for cash anymore. It's just an app. Um, and, and if they had to do all of that themselves, they wouldn't have a chance to do it but by having Collab actually move into business processes, I think that we're going to be able to lift a lot heavier and a lot more. And, and if I can repeat myself, the partner community that understand that piece is going to have a big competitive advantage on the other guys because there's a lot of untapped uh, uh, market out there and, and, and to, to get it. So that's my point of view. Maybe you guys disagree with me. We should, I, I completely agree. Um, I think it, it's a combination of, of, of all of the above because um, if, if we look at taking the component pieces of this Spark platform, or as some of us will call it a fabric, to weave into the platforms you might be subscribing to elsewhere, um, we announced a, a relationship with Salesforce where somebody who's a Salesforce customer is going to be able to log in as the administrator and enable inside Salesforce Spark. So you will be able to have all your Spark spaces, calling, video calling. And if you have Spark hybrid services deployed, that's a very unique integration. Because now I can have potentially desk phone control, automatically updating CRM records. I can embed my collaboration workloads into the different tools that I'm using. So you're going to see different releases from us coming in the near term of our relationship with Salesforce, our Spark widgets, where you're embedding the different pieces of Spark whether it's the chat or the video, into your own tools. But that also means that hybrid's more valuable. When I talk to enterprises, it's not all in, right? You don't have to have everything in the cloud. We're taking the pieces that are nearly impossible on-prem, as you said, as a partner, to integrate to all the different tools that you might have. In the cloud, we can really do that. It doesn't mean everything needs to be in the cloud, which is why we're so focused on the hybrid connection there as well. Because we want you to have that stable communications platform, but the pieces that change every day, 
mobile browser updates, third-party integrations that change all the time, we'll maintain that agile environment in the cloud for you so that you can embed the workloads you want throughout the different portfolios of products that you're consuming. Okay. I'm getting the sign that we've got, oh, we got a question. Last five minutes. Yes. I was just wondering how to get a scarf, so now I know. <laughs> this is it. No, I'm missing a bit the security part. I'm working for a government, so we, we, I see a lot of data flowing around Spark. So how you handle security? Yeah, so go ahead. So um, our key design requirement for when we started developing Spark was security. Um, and I think if I can start with the holistic one, you can probably double click on some of the more details. But if you think about it, Cisco's business model is distinctly different from that of Google or, or, or Facebook or others. We don't live off your data. It means that whenever you have data that goes into Spark, it's completely encrypted. Nobody can actually decrypt that data. It can only be done by you because you hold the keys. And, and I think that the amount of effort we actually went into designing this as a secure platform is tremendous. Jonathan Rosenberg, our CTO, he's actually here and he had a talk about an hour ago. He always covers a lot on the security pieces um, because we are distinctly different that way. It probably made us take an extra 12 months to develop the whole thing, but because our way of looking at this is, is different, our business is actually providing a collaboration tool for you. It's not getting hold of your data. So because of that, we've been able to design this differently. So that's the 30,000 foot view. Yeah. I, I think that summarizes great. It's, it's been a number one priority. It's end to end encrypted. Um, we spent a lot of development time ahead of time. It also means we put a lot of effort into making our integrations easier to consume. But the data that we send to our developers is fully encrypted. And then they have to go request the unencrypted data from our cloud. And we're actually releasing our full end to end encryption APIs as well. So for our third parties, they could actually maintain that encryption stream from your client all the way to a third party vendor and back to your client. And Cisco never ever sees an unencrypted device or, or message and as well as the third party partners. So we've, we've focused a lot on it and there's a lot of deep data that we could share on that. Yeah, we're no different. I mean, does this thing slow? Yeah, see, we're no different. I mean, in the United States, there's a, the federal government has a, a process called FedRAMP. Um, and we expect by the year end to be the only enterprise video solution that's FedRAMP approved. So there's a whole long binder of things that come with that. <laughs> OK, one final question, um, either from me or from the audience who wants a scarf. Anybody? No? Oh, OK. All right. Um, any final uh, sort of advice? Somebody in the audience, if you're in the audience and they're thinking about building their first cloud collab app, um, you know, Sarah, so you develop cloud apps or your team has, right? Any advice for the group or any final advice you have? Yeah, I mean, I think really when, when I think about it, the part that took the longest, and this is, you know, wasn't even really that long, but, the, but it was just actually coming up with what we wanted to build. Just you know, thinking about what we have to offer and then kind of all of the different options that we had and what was what would create the best value for the end user. And once we came up with that, building it was literally a matter of days. So did you go through like an ideation process to kind of figure out what really matters to the customer? Okay. Yeah, so we, you know, we went through, we kind of dipped our toe in the water and then kind of went from there. But, but really, the thought process was the most cool. time consuming part. OK, cool. Um, right. I think the more you understand about what's capable, the more your chances are to be a hero. So I, I say that because you've got the opportunity to understand what your line of business's pain points are, right? So learn how you can solve other problems within your business, because at that point, then you will look, you know, like you, you will be their hero, right? Whether it's use a Spark platform or something like ours, you make their lives easier, you will win. But to do that, you first got to understand what's capable. So if you understand what's possible, you have a good chance to solve internal problems. Great. Any other final advice? Or? I think that's such a good point. Come okay. up with a new use case because when we talk to customers, the number one thing they say is it's, it's not integrating into an existing business process or taking an existing business process and shoving it in Spark. It's we didn't even know this was possible. The business process is fundamentally changing. 
and start with DevNet. Seriously, those are, there are some great DevNet learning labs. There are a ton of classes here. I'm doing one tomorrow at noon on how to build a bot with zero programming knowledge. Right? There's a lot of resources here if you guys are interested. And you can walk away here with something fully up and running for your organization. Cool. You know, it's a paradigm shift. And when you have paradigm shifts, you can either stand at the side and watch what's happening, or what I would say, jump in and do it. Awesome. I think that's a great way to end the, note, uh, the day. I want to thank our panel. Uh, and I also like to thank our audience because you did, we're interactive. I'll tell you what, you've been such a good audience. For those who did get a scarf, come on up if you really want one and I'll give you one. And <laughs> here's, here's to a great audience and a great panel. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.